أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا من سيئات أعمالنا من يحدل الله فهو المحتد ومن يدلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا يا أيها الناس يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساعلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار اللهم صلي وسلم وزد وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى عاله وأصحابه وأحل بيته أجمعين رضوان الله عليهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Surely all praise and gratitude is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has united us here in his house on this blessed day of Jumu'ah as one ummah under kalimatul haq la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we testify and we state that there is no God worthy, God worthy of worship but Allah and that the Prophet Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his worshipping slave and his final messenger. As to what follows, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the 32nd chapter of the Quran, Surah As-Sajda, where he says, we have made a book of guidance for Bani Israel, for the children of Israel, when they showed patience and continued to have faith in our revelations, we raised amongst them leaders, leaders for the people who will be guided by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And mentioned among these, amongst these leaders is one, a king in fact, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of in the latter part of Surah Al-Kahf. Where he says to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ قُلْ سَأَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ مِّنْهُ ذِكْرًا That when they ask you, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about Dhul Qarnayn, say to them that I will give you a report to him. إِنَّا مَكَّنَّا لَهُ فِي الْعَرْضِ وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَبَبًا Indeed, we have established him on this earth. And we gave to him a way to everything. So he was well established on this earth, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him rulership, gave him dominion over land and over people. And Allah says that we have provided for him, this king, a way fi kulli shay, in everything. Now that things are being made easy for this king, there is a way, meaning via his army, via his skills, via his knowledge and his ability, Things have been made easy. So this king, he decides to travel in his realm. So he followed away until he reached a land where the sun sets on murky waters, meaning the west. And he met a set of people there. And being a king, if we look back in our own history not too long ago, we will see what the habits were of the kings and queens of our time. When they reached a people, the first thing that they tried to do was to annex them, to colonize them, to take over their land and expand their own empires. And oftentimes, when this colonialism took place, these individuals that fell under the colony, they lost their rights. Their rights and their honor were stripped away from them. And the same option is given to this king, Dhul Qarnayn, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْنَا يَا ذَا الْقَرْنَيْنِ إِمَّا أَن تُعَذِّبَ وَإِمَّا أَن تَتَّخِذَ فِيهِمْ حُسْنًا 
O Dhul Qarnayn, either you can punish them or you can adopt them amongst the way of goodness. And this is the mark of a true leader. This king decides, as the Quran states, قَالَ أَمَّا مَنْ ظَلَمَ فَسَوْفَ نُعَذِّبُهُ ثُمَّ يُرَدُّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِ فَيُعَذِّبُهُ عَذَابًا نُكْرًا وَأَمَّا مَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلَهُ جَزَاءً الْهُسْنَ وَسَنَقُولُ لَهُ مِنْ عَمْرِنَا يُسْرًا This king, he decides, he says, As for one who does wrong, we will punish him. And there is a punishment that awaits him with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a painful chastisement. But as for those who do good and those who believe, he will have a reward of Jannah with Allah azza wa jal, and we will speak to him with gentleness and with ease. This is by far away the most important quality in any leader. Someone who is fair and just. But what do we see happening around us today? Many individuals that hold positions of power and who hold positions of authority aren't necessarily qualified to be in that place. And as a result, there is this race, a contest of power that we all are caught up in, in struggling to gain authority and in struggling to gain dominion over others. And some of us may think, that, well, what if we were like Dhul Qarnayn? What if we were this righteous person that wanted to spread good and implement good? Then I remind myself first before reminding you, my brothers and my sisters, that if we have good intentions and we have a good agenda, but we are impatient, we lack the patience that it takes to implement that agenda properly, then we may not be the right people to implement that plan or that good action. And we find this is rampant in our society, this race for authority where everything and anything can be done because we tell ourselves that the end justifies the means. So we can lie, cheat, steal, backbite, make empty promises and so on just so that we can get what we want. And this action, this habit of making empty promises is far outside of Islam. Of telling people that we will do one thing and when it comes to us, when that time arises, we do nothing. It is far outside of Islam because we see that amongst the Khulafa or Rashidun, we see amongst them that when there was a time to accept responsibility, to accept any kind of authority over others, what did they do? Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu an, he used to say to the people when that time came, take Umar, choose Umar for this position. This is why Umar ibn al Khattab, this is why he's better suited to have that responsibility than me. And Umar would do the same thing. He would say, take Abu Bakr, he's better than me in X, Y, and Z. He is more fitting of this position. What is the hikmah behind this? Why did the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, why did they do this? The level of accountability and the level of responsibility that we have to those whom we have that authority over is so vast that when the time comes, when the day of Qiyamah arises, we ourselves, we wouldn't want to give account for our own actions. That would be the fear of Qiyamah. How then are we going to give reasoning to Allah Azza wa Jal for the things that we did with regards to others? This, my brothers and my sisters, this position, these acts of authority and these positions of authority, my brothers and my sisters, is very dire in the sight of Allah. And if we truly understood, if you and I, our hearts could comprehend what it means to be a righteous leader and what it means to be accountable to Allah, we would flee from any and every single position of authority. We would run from even being a janitor. Forget about being a president or a manager. We would run from being a janitor out of the fear that we may do injustice to the insects that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. There is a very, very fine line in between a person who, a leader, 
who is a liberator and one who is an oppressor. And when I say an oppressor, I do not mean political figures past and present. Each and every one of us, at some point in our lives, we will be given a responsibility over someone else. We will be tasked with an amana, with a trust of someone else's rights. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And chief amongst all of these positions that we may be given, we have one already. Alhamdulillah, Allah has granted us one already. That is being an abd, a servant of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah has created us so that we may worship Him and obey His commandments. That is our responsibility to Allah Azza wa Jal. He has given us everything. And what we need to do in return is serve Allah Jalla wa Ala. Each and every one of us may already find ourselves in these positions. A father has a responsibility to those in his household. And if he is negligent or if he, is, he has abandoned his responsibilities and his duties towards them, then he will be responsible to Allah. He will be accountable to Allah Azza wa Jal. Children have a responsibility and a duty to serve their parents, to be obedient to their parents and obedient to Allah Azza wa Jal. Children of all ages, be they children whom the parents still have to take care of, or be it children whom now the parents fall under their care. Siblings have a responsibility to one another. Family members, cousins have a responsibility to one another under that bond of kinship. But when that bond is broken, we will be held accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when their rights aren't fulfilled. As Muslims, we have rights over other Muslims and our Muslim brothers and Muslim sisters have rights over us as well. When we fail to fulfill those rights, we will have to answer to Allah Azza wa Jal. A manager or a boss has authority over his employees, but when he overworks them and underpays them, he will be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about it. So I ask myself and I ask you, are these positions of authority, do they still seem so attractive? Most surely not. And as the saying goes, all that glitters isn't gold. And here is why. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and he reported that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, that the supplication, the dua of three people are never turned away by Allah Azza wa Jal. A fasting person until he breaks his fast, a just ruler and the dua of an oppressed person. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not stop there. Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu an, he reported that the Messenger of, Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, Beware of the supplication of the oppressed. فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ هِجَابًا For there is no barrier between that dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you just imagine that you cause someone a tiny amount of undue distress? You said one harsh word to someone that you didn't even mean. And that individual makes dua against you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is no barrier between it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from this. But thus far, this is the most important point regarding leadership. Being fair and just despite having power and authority. And the surah progresses. Dhul Qarnayn, after reaching the west, he travels to the east. And he reaches a set of people who were indigenous per se. Until he came to a pass, a pathway that lies between two mountains. And he found beside these mountains a set of people who could hardly understand his speech. So they were far away from civilization. Their language, their tongue was different. But somehow they were able to communicate to this king. And they say to him, Ya Dhal Qarnayn, Inna ya'juja wa ma'juja mufsiduna fil ard. 
فهل نجعل لك خرجا على أن تجعل بينها بيننا وبينهم سدا أو ذو القرنين These tribes of Ya'juj and Ma'juj they are great corruptors on earth May we give you a token of our appreciation may we pay you some price so that you may erect a wall or some sort of barrier between us and them and he refused to take any kind of money he could have taken it and established his empire even more but he was content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him so he refused the money and he requested from them assist me just assist me in terms of manpower and I will erect that wall between you and them and what happens next shows us the level of transparency that any and every leader must have. He says to them, Atuni Zubar al Hadid, Hatta Ida Sawa Baina Sadafaini Kala and Fuku, Hatta Ida Jalahu Naran Kala Atuni Ufri Alehi Hitara. That bring me sheets of iron. And he leveled them, he pounded them out and erected this wall. And he said, blow into this fire to create a furnace. And he utilized the furnace to melt copper and throw it over this iron. He didn't leave them in the dark. He didn't keep his tactics and his methods a secret. He brought them into the light by giving them the knowledge that they needed to erect this wall. He didn't have fear. He wasn't afraid that because he taught them how to work with iron, that they would mold weapons and overtake him. That is the trust and the transparency that a righteous ruler has in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the second point. The righteous ruler has nothing to fear because he has nothing to hide. He is 110% transparent. But on the other hand, a leader that is corrupt, always has secrets a leader that is corrupt will always be on the lookout for those who can overtake him a leader that is corrupt will always re-establish his dominance to the people to show them that he is still in control and in charge because perhaps in their minds in the in, in the mind of the corrupt leader that is as good as it gets for them, the position of the dunya. And when we reach and we encounter people like this, my brothers and my sisters, really and truly we make dua for their guidance and for our guidance as well. And the surah progresses where this king, he says, when the wall has been finished, when he has erected it and it stands tall, firm and strong, imagine, a wall that has been built with a fusion of copper and iron creating a blend that's stronger than steel itself when it stands tall after all this hard work and manpower and labor this king he says that this wall this barrier is a mercy from my Lord. And when the promise of my Lord comes true, it will be level with the ground. Meaning the trials of Ya'juj and Ma'juj at the end of the dunya. For the, Lord, the promise of my Lord is ever true. He didn't take credit. There is humility there. The humility is there that him erecting this wall was a ni'mah from Allah Azza wa Jal alone. And sometimes we tend to forget that we as human beings, as Allah reminds us, and as we are reminded ever so often in this community, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. That from Allah we came, and to Allah we must return. And the position and the authority as well, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. That position was granted to us from Allah. And to Allah, that position will return with or without our permission. We are reminded in the Quran, الجبال, that on the day of Qiyamah, on Yawmul Hash, even the mountains will pass away. So, what about you and I, my brothers and my sisters? I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us 
and place in our hearts iman so that we will not be attached to the things of this dunya and may he provide for us a right course in our affairs wa akhiru da'wana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alamin Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fil amin innaka hamidun majid We lead others my brothers and my sisters through example We lead as parents we lead as children we lead as students in school we lead as a manager at our job. We lead as an imam for the community. We lead as Muslims by first implementing the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah of Habibuna Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam into our own lives. Our very akhlaq and adab, our mannerisms and our behavior should reflect that we are Muslims. When we get dressed in the morning, our clothing should indicate that we are Muslims. The way in which we get dressed itself should be an ibadah. The way we look when we have finished dressing should in and of itself serve as da'wah for others. When we look in the mirror, we, re we remind ourselves consistently that there is no place for pride. There is no place for narcissism in our lives because Allah has created us from dirt. And to dirt we must return. Our actions that we do daily should summarize and define the epitome of what it means to be a Muslim. When we hear that our brother and our sister in Islam has fell sick, we make haste to go and visit them and make dua for them because that is the right of one Muslim over another. When Allah decrees that a member of the Ummah of Habibuna Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam must return to him, we remind ourselves inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un and we attend the janazah of that brother or that sister because it serves as a timely reminder in this dunya of where we are, from whence we came and where we should be heading. Our words that we use, the way that we speak with others should speak volumes of the gentleness and the kindness that comes with being a Muslim. The things that we say both in public and in private should be closely guarded because we are Muslims. The way we respond to a conflict, to confusion, should be highly scrutinized and considered because we are Muslims. Our way of thinking should be free of any judgment towards others because we are Muslims. We should not feel superior to any other person because of their race or because of the color of their skin, because we are Muslims. Because as Muslims, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us equal and in the sight of Allah, we are all equal and we will all be equally held accountable. We cleanse our hearts of being judgmental towards others because we know that Allah is Maliki Yawmiddin. He is the master of the day of judgment and to him belongs all judgment. We know this because we are Muslims. When we look at someone, we see the good in them and we forego the bad because we are Muslims. We never look to harm someone for any reason simply because we are Muslims. When we see injustice, we stand up for justice, even if it be against our own. When we see someone being treated unfairly, even if it is someone we may not get along with, we stand up for justice on behalf of that individual. It is incumbent upon us because we are Muslims. The entire world should be safe from the evil of our hands and the evil of our tongue because we are Muslim. When we give our zakah, it's not about the two and a half percent that we give. The two and a half percent is a minuscule amount. It is about the sadaqah that we give along with our zakah. Do we give that zakah or that sadaqah with a smile or with a face of scorn? When we give that charity, do we give it with our right hand so that we can tell our left hands about it later? 
When we give our charity as Muslims, my brothers and my sisters, we do so in such a manner that the person receiving that charity is left with a resounding impact. This is what it means to be a Muslim. We pray our salah with the utmost khushu, utmost concentration, and utmost humility in front of Allah because that is the first thing we will be questioned about on Qiyamah. That is the only thing that will come to avail us on Qiyamah, our salah. We know this because we are Muslims. We make hajj at the earliest convenience, as soon as we can, because it is one of the arkan of being a Muslim. When we profess the shahada, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we profess and we testify that shahada with profound belief, with profound respect and acceptance of the commands of Allah and of the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We cannot pick and choose as to which parts we will obey versus which parts we choose to neglect. We know this because we are Muslims. We submit to Allah alone, my brothers and my sisters, simply because we are Muslims. That is the Muslim leader. You and I, those in authority and are aware of their authority and those of us who may not be aware of our authority, that is what the Muslim leader is. The one who leads by example. The one whose doctrine is the Quran and whose path is Sirat al-Mustaqim. Otherwise, it's pointless. Otherwise, our living in this dunya becomes pointless. The things that we do have no fruit. They bear no fruit to our nafs, our soul, our being. Because no matter how lofty our position is in this dunya, my brothers and my sisters, without the Quran and without the Sunnah, we are lost not only here, but we are lost in the Akhirah as well. And I have always said and used this example. That whatever it is that we are in this dunya, we are Muslim first. Islam always come first. You could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer, you could be a businessman, and you can be an engineer. But in and at the same time, we remind our hearts that whilst being these positions, we are a Muslim doctor. Otherwise, what's the point? of going to medical school for X amount of years. But you can't find the cure for that ache in your heart because the cure is the Quran, not in a biology textbook. What is the fruit of attending law school for X amount of years? But we lack understanding of the intricacy and the importance of the laws of Islam. Where is the benefit of being a huge trader or a big and renowned businessman when we cannot see that the value of the akhirah outweighs the value of the dunya how does it benefit us that we are engineers and we build lofty skyscrapers and massive infrastructure but we are feeble at building our own home in jannah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place in our hearts iman May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to live our lives according to the sunnah of Habibuna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us authority if it is beneficial for us. And may he keep us away from any authority if it will earn us his displeasure. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of those in our community who are sick, shifa, a cure that leaves no illness behind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of those who have departed our community Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make for them and for us the trial of the grave easy and may, on the day of Qiyamah. May Allah resurrect us with our book of deeds in our right hand and may He call us from the gates of Jannah. اللهم عدنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وعدنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه إباد الله 
رحمكم الله إن الله يعمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغض يأذكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله يذكركم وأدوه يستجب لكم ولا ذكر الله تعالى أعلى وأجل وأتم وأهم وأكبر وأقيم الصلاة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر